So good morning. It is now almost 11.30, and I'd ask the meeting to come, please come to order. My name is Ronald Cliff, and I'm the director and chairman of the board of Canfor Corporation, and I will be acting as chairman of this meeting. I'm delighted to extend a warm welcome to all of you today for the 30th annual general meeting of Canfor Corporation as a public company. At this point, it is my great pleasure to introduce our president and chief executive officer, Don Kane, who is seated beside me, and will be calling on Don later in the meeting to address you. With your indulgence, I propose that any questions you may have be reserved until after you've heard from Don, unless the questions relate to the particular motion on the floor. Also seated at the head table is David Calabrigo, the Senior Vice President, Corporate and Legal Affairs and Corporate Secretary, and David will act as Secretary of this meeting, and I would now like to introduce to you all our directors. Alphabetically, Peter Bentley, Glenn Clark, Michael Kornberg, Jim Patterson, Conrad Panette, Michael S Max Singleton of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Ross Smith, and Will Bill Stinson. They have all worked hard, and I, we all appreciate their wise counsel. It is also very appropriate to express my appreciation for the contribution that all the company's personnel have made during this past year, and therefore to introduce the other officers of the company. And again, dealing it with them alphabetically, Gus Buto, Vice President Herman Resources, Alistair Cook, Senior Vice President Wood Products, Oops. Patrick Elliott, Vice President and Treasurer, Mark Feldinger, Senior Vice President, Forestry, Environment and Energy, Wayne Guthrie, Senior Vice President, Sales and Marketing, Alan Nickel, Senior Vice President, Finance and Chief Financial Officer, Doug Worsler of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, President of Canfor Southern Pine. Thank you, gentlemen. I hereby appoint CIBC Mellon Trust Company to act as scrutineers for the meeting, and I would now call on Mr. Calabrigo to deal with the notice of this meeting. Thank you. I will now ask the Secretary to read the preliminary sc scrutineer's report. Thank you. Uh, as chairman, I now adopt the scrutineer's report and declare that the attendance at this meeting is proper and it is, and it is set forth. In accordance with that report, I declare that there is a quorum present and the meeting is duly constituted for the transaction of business. And I would ask all those who have agreed to move and second motions ahead of time be kind enough to give their names and state whether they are a shareholder or a proxy holder. Just in general, as you would all know, there are certain necessary motions for an annual meeting that must be made and seconded. In order to help expedite the meeting, some of the shareholders have graciously agreed in advance to make or second these various motions, but it is no way intended to inhibit, intended to inhibit any questions or discussion on the particular motion or any one of them. The minutes of the last meeting of shareholders are available for perusal by any shareholder. And unless someone wishes them read, I will entertain a motion to take the minutes as read and to approve them. Thank you, Mr. Pankratz. Is there a seconder? Thank you very much, Ms. Zion. You've heard the motion. All in favor, please signify in the usual manner by raising your hand. Contrary, if any, declare the motion carried. The next item of business is to place before this meeting the consolidated financial statements of the company for the year ended December 31st, 
2011, together with the auditor's report and the report of the directors to the members. These statements are reports and reports are contained in the company's annual report, uh, which has been mailed to shareholders, and there are many copies at the back of the room for those of you. Unless there are any questions, I will regard these statements and reports as having been received by the meeting. It is now time for the election of directors, and the meeting is now open for nominations. My name is Renee Villeneuve. I am a shareholder of the company. I nominate Peter J. G. Bentley, Glenn D. Clark, Ronald L. Cliff, Michael J. Kornberg, James A. Patterson, Conrad A. Pinnett, J. McNeil Mack Singleton, Ross S. Smith, William, S. William W. Stinson, as directors of the company to hold office until the next annual general meeting. Thank you, Ms. Villeneuve. The persons nominated are management's nominees for election, as was stated in the information circular mailed to the shareholders of the company. Are there any further nominations? There being no further nominations, I declare nominations closed, and as only the required number of persons have been nominated, I declare that those persons nominated have been duly elected by acclamation as directors of the company to hold office until the next annual general meeting. The next item is the appointment of auditors, and it is the board's recommendation that the present auditors be reappointed. May I have a motion to that effect? Thank you, Mr. Kornberg. May I have a seconder? My name is Greg Jung, and I'm a shareholder of the company. I second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Jung. You've all heard the motion. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Contrary, if any. Oh, no, I guess I better keep them on. <laughs> I declare PricewaterhouseCoopers LLP chartered accountants be appointed auditors for the ensuing year. Before asking our president, Don Kane to address you on our current positive outlook, I thought it would be a good idea to bring you up today on certain management and board matters. Following the annual general meeting last year, the board of directors decided to realign the senior management of the company. This opportunity was made possible by the retirement from the company of four senior executives. It is a tribute to the talents and the depth of our current senior staff that every one of the six positions so created was filled from within the ranks of the company, save and except one outside hire who incidentally was a former long-term employee of, of Canfor, returning to the nest, you might say. The resulting new team was introduced to you earlier in the meeting, and I wish to congratulate them on the outstanding and effective effort all of them have contributed during this last year. Your, your board joins me in thanking them for their accomplishments. I should also like to report that in early March this year, Canfor decided to convert its investment in Canfor Holdings Partnership into common shares of Canfor Pulp Products Incorporated. Since the original organization of the pulp mills was based on an income trust, and since income trusts of this nature are no longer tax effective, the decision to convert was quite apparent. As a result, Canfor has now the owner 50.2% of Canfor Pulp Products, making the company a controlled subsidiary. And now I'd ask Don Kane to address the meeting. Don? Get rid of all your stuff. That's okay. Yep. Lots of okay, thanks, Ron, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today and, and also for your ongoing support of Canfor. Uh, before addressing Canfor's business and results, I want to take a moment to reflect on the tragic explosion of the Sinclair Group's Lakeland Mills in Prince George on Monday night. Forestry is a close-knit community uh, in British Columbia, and we are all deeply affected by this tragedy. Canfor holds a one-third stake in the Sinclair Group, and Lakeland is part of the broader Canfor family. Tragically, two men have lost their lives in the incident, and several others remain in hospital. Of course, our foremost concerns are with the entire Lakeland team, most particularly those that were injured and their families. We are also conscious of the fact that this is the second serious fire this year for a BC interior sawmill. While it is much too early to speculate on the possible cause, 
of the Lakeland Fire. This event, combined with the recent explosion at Babine Forest Products in Burns Lake, has caused us to redouble our effort on safety. Government has already committed to inspection of all SOMO facilities, and we support their rapid, re rapid response in assessing the situation and helping the industry to identify and manage risk. Canfor is the industry leader in safety, and we intend to remain so. Housekeeping and safety standards have always been a top priority in this company, and they remain so today. We are taking immediate action to mitigate dust issues across the company, and as the factors that contributed to the Lakeland and Babine fires become known, we will take the findings into account across Canfor's operations. So turning to business of the day, uh, this meeting is the first for this Canfor executive group. We were appointed to our current roles after last year's annual general meeting, and for all staff all across this company, 2011 has been a year of tremendous achievement. We have made significant progress in implementing our strategy toward being the most competitive lumber manufacturer in the business. It is a privilege to be here today to highlight a few of our activities and accomplishments from the last year and to, erect, and, and to recognize the immense contributions of employees from across this great company. I would also like to emphasize how our investments and efforts fit within our strategic vision and how they position us for the future. Market conditions for lumber remain challenging in 2011, owing primarily to the sustained curtailment of U.S. housing starts. In 2011, we posted a $56.6 million loss on $2.4 billion in sales, or 40 cents per share, disappointing results that reflect the difficult conditions our sector has faced in most markets. The U.S. market has stabilized, but has been slow to recover. Although the European Union is not a major market for Canfor, the sovereign debt crisis there worked to undermine economic confidence at all levels and acted to slow down global economic recovery. Our EBITDA in 2011 was close to 180 million, which largely reflected the strong pulp markets where prices reached record levels during the year. For our lumber segment, we essentially broke even on an EBITDA basis in 2011. It is important to emphasize, however, that our balance sheet remains very strong and Canfor has emerged from this unprecedented global economic downturn, stronger, more agile, and is ready for growth. In fact, I'm proud to note that we have grown significantly over 2011. Turning to Q1 2012 performance, today we are reporting a net loss of 16.2 million on sales of 607.6 million, or 11 cents per share. After adjusting for various items, operating results overall are slightly down from the fourth quarter of 2011, largely reflecting weaker results in the pulp and paper segment. Our Q1 results were also negatively impacted by our stronger Canadian dollar, which was up roughly 2% over last quarter. Uh, market conditions in the U.S., however, are showing improvement, which is encouraging. We saw some solid improvements in North American lumber prices over the quarter, we are also seeing slow but steady gains in U.S. housing starts, which are now reported close to 700,000. Gains in U.S. pricing were unfortunately offset by continued weakness in offshore low-grade prices. Well, with inventories in China returning to more balanced levels, we expect to see improvement in low-grade prices over quarter two. 2011 was a busy year for Canfor, and we have made major progress in setting the operating foundations to meet our commitment to achieve top, quor top quartile performance by quarter one, 2013. In May 2011, we initiated a strategic planning process that included participation for all of Canfor's executive and senior management, and that was enhanced by a dedicated strategic planning session with our board of directors. We also began 2011 with the objective of continuing to roll out our capital investment plan, implementing our green fiber strategy, and updating our brand positioning to better communicate Canfor's strengths to customers, communities, and current and future employees. I am, I am extremely pleased with the progress we have made on all of these fronts, and we'll touch on several of these today. I've been with Canfor for 33 years, and I cannot recall a more exciting time to be a part of this company. There is no question that the economic storm that we have faced over the last several years was incredibly difficult, not only for employees and shareholders, but also for our communities, contractors, and suppliers, each of which is a key stakeholder in our company's future. 
But the sun is rising on the forest product sector and Canfor is exceptionally well positioned to capitalize on our industry's improving fortunes. In my view, this company holds the best fiber position, the best relationships, the best customers, and far away the best and most com committed employees in the business. I believe very strong that as demand recovers and expands in the years ahead, these factors will, will also make us the best performing forest products company. I am proud of the advancements we have made through 2011, and most of all, I am proud of our team. While I know Canfor will prosper based on the focus and the cohesion of our exceptional team of people, external demand factors also have a significant effect. Global population growth will have a material influence on our business. In 2011, the Earth reached a population milestone of 7 billion people. Over the next decade, we expect a further 1 billion people to be added to the planet. Of course, billions of additional people create pressures on the carrying capacity of the natural environment, requiring thoughtful decisions about how to provide shelter, energy, and sustenance in the most sustainable fashion. The, this issue is prompting governments around the world to look for ways to accommodate unprecedented growth and with the lowest possible impact on the environment. They know the choice of building products used to house growing populations has a huge environmental impact. It is no surprise then that methods of advancing green, environmentally responsible construction are increasingly a focal area for governments, businesses and citizens around the world, and wood is an obvious solution. Governments and organizations that have embraced a thoughtful and scientific approach to be, are beginning to appreciate the capacity that wood products have to reduce the environmental impacts of construction. Wood is the only renewable building material and it uses less energy to produce than steel or concrete and wood structures are more energy efficient to heat and to cool. Wood is also the only natural building material and it grows from the power of the sun. Growing, world, excuse me, growing worldwide recognition for the green attributes of wood construction is being reflected in changes to government policies around the world. The government of China issued a white paper last November that advocates for wood use as a means of combating climate change. The government of Japan has passed a law requiring wood to be used in public buildings wherever possible. These are just two examples of rapidly shifting public perceptions in favor of sustainable wood products. This new environmental paradigm is opening doors for wood products and generating demand for the materials we produce. Canfor has always been an innovator in global market development and our exceptional sales force is working to expand our reach in existing markets and to grow new and diverse markets for our products. We were the very first North American lumber company in China and thanks to 10 years of hard work that nation has become the largest off offshore destination for our lumber. The fact that about 30% of our production is shipped to China doesn't tell the full story. Without the Chinese market, Canfor and other Canadian producers would have faced a catastrophic situation when the US market fell off so dramatically. China has become a stable, consistent, and significant market for our products, owing largely to the visionary work by Canfor employees and a groundbreaking collaboration with our federal and provincial governments. Through the work, work of staff like Mako Liu, who's the president of our Canfor Asia group, and Bill Caverly, who was the general manager of Offshore at the time, we helped grow wood-based construction from relatively, relative obscurity to the recommended method of green construction projects for the Chinese central government. Demand for Canfor products is building across Asia. Employees such as Frank Turnbull, our general manager of international sales and marketing, Jason Nomura, our president of Canfor Japan, are building on our experience in China and Japan to grow new markets in Thailand, Vietnam, India, and the Middle East. With respect to India, we will not see significant demand for wood products there for some time, but that was true of China as well a decade ago. And last year, Canada shipped more than a billion dollars worth of lumber to China. At Canfor, we are committed to maintaining the aggressive but mindful approach to market development in promising economies around the world that have served us so well over the previous decades. Of course, there is no point in building demand for, demand, for products that we can't supply, and that is where our fiber and our human capital advantages show their greatest strengths. Canfor has a great access to premium wood fiber than our, than our comp, comp, competitors, 
Our exposure to the mountain pine beetle epidemic is not as significant as some other companies, and we are working to further reduce the impact of the infestation by acquiring additional green fiber resources. In 2011, we moved to acquire Tembeck Industries Southern BC interior wood processing assets and associated tenures. When that deal closed about a month ago, we added 1.1 million cubic meters in annual harvesting rights, 420 million board feet of annual production capacity, and 505 new CANFOR employees that joined us from Tembeck. The East Kootenai region has exceptional high quality green fiber, and this acquisition is an important part of the company's strategy to green up our fiber base and to grow both our top and bottom line performance. We will soon be announcing capital investments of more than 40 million in our southern BC mill facilities, ensuring cost competitive, sustainable operations in this region of the province. We will also be introducing some exciting new brand initiatives beginning with this region. I would also like to note that an acquisition of this size takes a remarkable effort by a whole lot of people, ensuring that there is a seamless transition for employees, for customers, for suppliers, involves an incredible amount of work that goes on behind the scenes, from IT staff ensuring that computer systems will work to the payroll staff that processed all the new CANFOR employees, to Heather, Bur Heather Burton in communications who took the lead on applying the CANFOR brand to hundreds of signs throughout the operations. We sometimes forget about all the behind the scenes effort, and I want to thank everyone who was a part of this, this overall deal and the transition. Of course, part of our work toward being top quartile means ensuring that our facilities are modern, efficient, and able to cost-effectively meet future demand. In 2011, we invested $155 million of our $300 million capital investment program, including major upgrades to several of our sawmills. Our Vavenby facility resumed operation on September 6th after a $24 million upgrade that included a new canner line, a new grade optimizer in the planer, and an upgraded planer feed system. Capital investments of $13 million at PG Saw have significantly improved the mill's operating efficiency. A planer project was also completed at Polar Sawmill, and in Grand Prairie, Alberta, we also completed a planer upgrade, along with major log yard upgrades and the purchase of what is now the Canfor Green Energy Cogeneration Facility. Capital projects in Grand Prairie were significant, and Lyle Disher, our general manager of the Eastern Region, deserves credit for his leadership and performance during that period. In addition to the staff at each facility that were involved in these projects, I'd like to recognize the exceptional work of Rick Wilson, who's the general manager of business optimization, who has managed a technically and geographically complex Canadian capital investment program on time and on budget. Canfor has focused on reducing our reliance on purchased fossil fuels to heat our mills by installing carbon neutral wood burning energy systems, installing enhanced optimization technology to improve recovery and increase up output, and we are investing in automated grading technology to improve the consistency and quality outturn of our sawmills. Our mill investments are driven by a firm target of top quartile performance by quarter one, 2013. I am pleased to say we are clearly on track to achieve that target. We are setting new production records as upgraded mills move into production. Over the last month, <clears throat> both Grand Prairie and Prince George set planar production records. These records aside, what we are seeing are steady, sustained performance improvements that contribute to the company's operating performance. We have a simple formula. Hire the best people and give them the tools they need to make us the top performer in our industry. I, knew, I know I speak for all my executive team when I say we know our employees will help us achieve these targets as long as we prepare them for success and support them along the way. In 2012, we will be spending more time talking to operational staff and hourly employees to ensure that they understand our goals and we have a better understanding of their needs. Our regular mill vis visits are just one way that we plan to improve communication with employees at all levels this year. Our employees are the key to our success. I want them to know it, and I want to know that as a management team, we are doing everything we can to support their work. We also want to be sure everyone at Canfor is committed to the three major goal areas that we articulated in 2011, safety, quality, and profitability. We are proud that the careful work of our staff has made us industry leaders in safety, 
our injury rate is less than a third of the sector average. I recently visited North and South Carolina for the President's Safety Awards, and I would like to acknowledge the leadership of the Canfor Southern Pine Mills that were recognized for the lowest MIR rates. Terry Bishop, our general manager of the Graham Mill, which has, the lowest, has had the lowest MIR rate for all our sawmills from 2009 through to 2011. Mitchell Fry, our general manager of the Marion Mill, that was the winner for the remanufacturing with a rate of zero. And I would also like to note the achievement of New South Express, a subsidiary trucking company that operates a fleet of trucks that transport our products to market under General Manager Carl Hamilton. New South Express has received the South Carolina Industrial Safety Award for each of the past four years. All across this company, we will do everything we can to maintain our safety record. We can never be satisfied as long as there is the potential that our employees could get hurt on the job. Our top priority is to make sure every Canfor employee has a safe working environment. And we will continue to raise the standards of industrial workplace safety and improve our performance in 2012. Our commitment to quality is also central to everything we do. Canfor is a reliable producer of quality products and has been for 75 years. Quality encompasses our products, our environmental stewardship, and the relationships the company has with, it, with its communities, First Nations, customers, and other stakeholders. We want our customers to recognize Canfor as an industry leader so they continue to make us their first choice as a supplier. We need to provide best-in-class supply chain management and logistic support to maintain the superior customer service we've built our reputation on. Bob Hayes, our General Manager of Global Supply, does an exceptional job on this for us. At both a corporate and individual level, we aim to be respected members of the communities in which we operate. While I could point to a great many, let me single out Mike Grimm, our General Manager of the West, who is trusted and highly regarded throughout the, his mills and his communities and demonstrates the quality of leadership that, <clears throat> that will make the attainment of our goals possible. Of course, our third goal is profitability, and across the Canfor enterprise, we are committed to ensuring this company is top quartile producer by Q1 2013, as I've said a few times. We are relentlessly focused on making sure our staff have the tools to succeed because we appreciate that, that, <clears throat> we, are, that we appreciate that their actions every day are the basis of our success. This will drive our bottom line performance and our profitability. I have mentioned the capital upgrades in several of our Canadian facilities, but would also note that Canfor Southern Pine has also installed planar optimization systems in all mills and completed other capital projects over the last 18 months. We have been particularly impressed with the incredible dedication showed by the Southern Pine staff who have overseen production increases from 270 million board feet in 2009 to, to a 460 million foot target in 2012. The entire Canfor Southern Pine Division made money in quarter one and anticipates an excellent quarter two as the operations move further away from startup curves and capitalize on the benefits of new equipment. One of the benefits of operating a company the size of Canfor is the opportunity for sharing ideas and best practices across our divisions and coming up with a whole that is greater than the sum of our individual sawmills. We are seeing an excellent example of this and the improved communication and cross-functional sharing that, this, that has followed Keith McGregor joining Canfor Southern Pine earlier this year as VP of Southern Operations. Dave Dodge, our Vice President of Procurement, and his group have done a superb job of bringing fiber costs down at New South this, or at Canfor Southern Operations this year. As you probably can tell, I am consistently impressed by the many contributions made by Canfor staff in all our operations and at every level. Charlie Mainz, our regional manager in the West, is the constant champion of his mills and his employees and is always there to offer advice and support to his colleagues. Stephen Mackey, our regional manager in the East, has taken on Canfor Green Energy and the East Kootenai Mills this year, a significant and geographically widespread growth in responsibility. From Grand Prairie to Elko, Stephen covers a huge region for Canfor. All of our managers deserve special recognition and, of course, <clears throat> and of course, a speech like this doesn't provide enough time to remark on everyone's achievements. Uh, the work of, the, of staff at all levels is equally important, though. This spring, a Canfor employee in Houston, Duarte de Tevis, marks 50 years with Canfor. Duarte is a Letourneau operator and is the number one employee on Canfor's seniority list. 
Although the company, no doubt, although the company and his colleagues would love to honor him, he is far too modest and turned down plans for an event. Thank you, Duarte, for many years of service. Can for employees at every level and in every function are the key to achieving our pledge to be top quartile while maintaining our focus on the safety, quality, and profitability. They include people like Tom Lewis, who's the regional manager of the Forest Management Group in Prince George. Tom has been with Canfor for 14 years and he's an excellent example of the kind of determined effort and relentless focus that means so much to our company. Mind you, he probably would be the first to say to his colleagues in operations and, and give credit to them and the staff that deserve all the credit. This year alone, Tom and his team managed some tough assignments. They resolved a trucker strike in Fort St. John, balancing Canfor's interests with the realities of an extremely competitive labor market and maintaining critical supplier relationships. They began a process of executive engagement that improved the relationship between Canfor and its trucking and contracting communities and they led the forest management analysis and integration functions related to our acquisition of more than 1 million cubic meters of top quality green fiber at Tembeck. I would also like to thank Bob Montague, our general manager Interior West and his forest management group. They kept our mills supplied during the absolute wettest forest conditions on record in British Columbia's interior last year, including at times when the supply in some of our mill yards were down to hours. So part of Canfor's success formula is our relationship with our communities, which of course includes the municipalities we, we work in, but also First Nations communities as well. These relationships are the foundation of maintaining Canfor's social license to operate. We engage closely with our mayors and First Nations chiefs because we value their input and because they provide such an essential leadership function in ensuring that our communities remain vibrant places to live, work, own a home, and raise a family. I have met this year with the mayors of each of Canfor's BC and Alberta operating communities. To name just a few, I would remark that Mayor Sherry Green in Prince George has been exceptional, and we appreciate her solid effort of additional trades training in Prince George. David Calabrigo and I were recently in McKenzie as sponsors of Mayor Stephanie Killam's Hockeyville event there, where Canucks alumni played against local teams with most of the town attending. We have received some thoughtful input lately on midterm timber supply issues from Mayor Jerry Thiessen of Vanderhoof and appreciate the opportunity to work with him and other mayors in the region to identify policy opportunities. Mayor Thiessen also recently joined Mayor Holmberg of Houston, Mayor Green and others at a reception we held in Prince George. Mayor Dee Conklin and staff in Radium Hot Springs have been extremely helpful and welcoming and we appreciate her engagement. Mayor Bill Gibbons and his council have also recently visited our Grand Prairie Sawmill just prior to the demolition of the log yard crane in the community. I also met recently in Prince George with Chief Frederick Dominique, in Cranbrook with Chief Catherine Tenise, and had dinner at the National Aboriginal Achievement Awards with Chiefs Fred Sam, David Lugy, and Ralph Pierre, and a group of 14 First Nations students pursuing forestry-related forestry -related, post-secondary education. Continuing to develop these and other relationships will remain an area of focus going forward. 2013 will mark our 75th year in the forest products business. Canfor has a bright future ahead with a solid foundation in a proud corporate history. From its origins in 1938 with the founding Bentley and Prentice families through Peter Bentley's tenure as president and chief executive officer and on to today, Canfor has been a major contributor of wealth and employment to our operating communities. We launched a new website in 2011 with a fresh, forward-looking approach that is really in a class of its own among Canadian resource industries. You may have noticed that our annual report, sustainability report, and website all feature a We Are Canfor theme, with each highlighting some of the exceptional people and achievements across the company. I'm also pleased to note that we just released our 2011 sustainability report, which was prepared to, for, to the Global Reporting Initiative Sustainable Reporting Framework. This significantly expanded our disclosures and demonstrates our commitment to transparency. Canfor has a great story to tell, and it is crit critically important that we find ways to tell this story as we continue to grow. One of the most significant challenges we see on the horizon is attracting the skilled workers we need to meet production demands. 
If we hope to compete in today's tough labor market, we must make sure more people know about the benefits of a career at Canfor and demonstrate we are a responsible, respected corporation. I received some interesting insight earlier this year when I visited our mill in Chetwin and spent a few minutes with a young man named Maury Hone, one of our planer supervisors. Maury told me he was one of five business students who graduated in 2007. He pointed out that he is the only one who chose a career within the forest products sector, and he is the only one whose job does not offer advantages such as a housing allowance, spousal job placement, among other things. This isn't the kind of thing I want to hear when Canfor, like other resource companies, is struggling to attract talent. But I want to be clear, Maury wasn't sharing his insights with me because he felt disadvantaged. He offered his thoughts because he cares about the company and was concerned we would be at a disadvantage competing with other industries, and he's right. It takes a lot for a, for a new planer supervisor to tell the CEO that our company couldn't match offers being made by other employers but it's something I needed to hear, and it reminded me how much I value the new generation of talent joining Canfor. Competition is growing. We will soon face a retention challenge, just as we are facing a recruitment challenge today. Ours is an exceptional company filled with exceptional people, and it is important to remember that each would be welcome in and recruited by other companies and, and other sectors. We need to be alert and responsive to people's needs, both to attract them and to retain them. And we absolutely know we won't succeed if we wind up in a foot race with other resource companies or other industries for skilled workers. We need to address the labor pool on an absolute basis or we will only cannibalize each other's workforce and drive up costs. We will also need to adopt greater responsiveness to the needs and the expectations of the next generation workforce because we know they are going to have plenty of options. We have several initiatives in place to dispel outdated perceptions of the forest industry and make sure new workers know the forest product sector offers diverse, exciting careers serving markets around the globe. So as we look ahead to 2012 and beyond, Canfor will maintain a relentless focus on safety, market development, fiber supply, production efficiency and human capital. We will continue to refine our production facilities to achieve top quartile performance, operating safe and efficient facilities, processing some of the best fiber the world has to offer. We will continue to work to grow markets for our products while maintaining a tireless focus on meeting the needs of our existing customers around the world. We will continue to invest in our most important resource, our employees. They are key to our success, retaining the quality people we have and encouraging new talent to join our organization is key to our success and will remain a core focus of our activities in 2012. Our vision for the future is ambitious but achievable and we have a clear and logical plan for getting there. With the employees I pointed out today and with we also have a uniquely committed and incredibly capable team devoted to making the, this company the very best that it can be. While business conditions remain uneven, all of us at Canfor are filled with a sense of optimism for the future. That includes our staff here in BC, in Grand Prairie, Alberta, St. Foix, Quebec, Bellingham, Washington, across our network in North and South Carolina, as well as our lumber sales offices in China and Japan. It also includes the more than 150 staff in Vavenby, BC, that came back to work this year due to capital investments making that mill economic and the 505 employees that recently joined Canfor from Tembak. For those of you here today, I thank you for your continued support. I genuinely look forward to working with Canfor's exceptional board with our large Canfor family to continue to build this great company to its full potential. I would like to express my partic particular thanks to the members of my executive team who have provided exceptional leadership and maintained our relentless focus on achieving top quartile performance. I would also like to express my personal appreciation and that of the executive team to Ron Cliff, our chairman, and to all of our board for their, for their support and guidance throughout the last year. It has been simply tremendous, and we are a stronger company because of your time and your input. Thanks very much. Thank you, Don. That was an excellent uh, assembly of notes and thoughts about the company, which I think we're indebted to you for the thoughtfulness you put into that, those remarks. It is now appropriate at this time of the meeting for questions from the shareholders. 
If there are any questions, please identify yourself as a shareholder or a proxy holder and your name, please. My name is Hubert Bunce, and I'm a shareholder of the company. And years ago, I was an employee of the company. Uh, two things I'd like to congratulate you, uh, Mr. King, and particularly on how broad a coverage you have given to the, uh, the company and congratulate. But one person you didn't congratulate, and I think it's the most senior employee, and maybe if I look on your face, you know who I'm talking about, you published this year, or somebody published, a book called The Canful Story. And I was very appreciative that that happened. And I think uh, somebody here should get credit for the work you put into it. I'm sure it's a very difficult thing to sort out all the history and the facts and get them down exactly as they should be. There was just one thing I did miss. And there was a word missing. And it was the word bull, B-U-L-L. -L -L. And I don't know whether Peter appreciated that. There was a story about a cook at Englewood, and really he was a bull cook. He wasn't just a regular cook, he was a bull cook. Uh, otherwise, I do have a question I'd like to ask. You have your directors sitting here, a very fine body of men, and in the middle of them is a lady. But she wasn't presented as a director. And I just wondered why you don't have any ladies uh, as directors, because I do feel, <laughs> I, I do feel that the, the male mind has got one track and the female mind has got a slightly different track. And I think you can gain something by having a director. Now, I don't know whether it's too late to correct that this year, but I think maybe in the future you could keep that in mind, that perhaps you could find some lady who would love to be a director. Maybe this lady would, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for all you've all done. I thank will you. congratulate you all on your efforts towards the product. The thank you for your remarks and particularly your, your thanks to Peter Bentley because sharing an office with Peter, I know how much time and effort he put into that book. It was six months of hell. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for the comments on Mars and Venus. We take note of your comments. When there's an opportunity, we, I'm sure we'll have the possibility of, of looking for others sexes on the board. <laughs> Any other questions? As there's no uh, further business, I will entertain a motion to conclude the meeting. Chairman, my name is Pat Kelly. I'm a shareholder. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. May I have a seconder? Mr. Chairman, my name is Edith Chan, and I'm a shareholder of the company. I second the motion. Thank you very much, Ms. Chan. All those in the favor of the motion, please raise their hands. Contrary, if any, I declare the meeting closed, and I thank you all for your attendance.